Ooh, that was an awful sound. I don't sound that awful, do I? <laughs> Welcome, guys, to uh, um, the fourth week of uh, Zoom discussions about these tarot cards. Um, this week, we're going to talk about the suit of wands. And I decided to jump to the suit of wands from the coins because I didn't really want to have you think that um, that the deck is is too focused on that sort of order that we often think of with the with the um, the elements, um, and that is actually true of of you know the Rider deck or the, the Alistair Crowley deck or most other decks. The elements are essentially not being viewed in a hierarchical way necessarily they're just simply you know functions of things in our normal lives for the most part so um thinking of them as a tetragrammaton or thinking of them in terms of like the earth being you know at the low level and the fire being at the high level i think that kind of muddies the waters pun not intended um for you know interpreting them as just sort of being parts of people's lives so i decided to jump to the wands partially because i because i really like them but um and also because i didn't want to you know overemphasize that idea of hierarchy within things so next week we'll either do the swords or the cups i don't know i'm gonna let my my um instinct and imagination guide that uh, over the coming week so um, the, the suit of wands, you know, in, in a lot of tarot decks is uh, pretty closely identified with the element of fire. And um, that is really only true functionally within these cards. Um, th there's a little sort of, um, let me see if I can get, there we go, a little pattern along the side that has kind of a fiery quality to it and certainly more than, than the other little patterns. Um, but other than that, it's not really heavily associated with fire. I know that some people in certain Wiccan circles and, and elsewhere as well kind of switch the, the, the swords and the wands as, as to whether they're related to fire or air. And I didn't really want to overemphasize um, one element over another because ultimately they don't really have anything to do <laughs> with those particular elements in, in my deck in particular and really in, in, in all decks, although perhaps a little bit visually. Um, the, the the ace of wands in my deck is based upon um, all the aces in the deck are based upon sort of what I what I kind of consider iconic or emblematic um, images and, and ideas from the Greek magical papyri, um, and this is this in particular is a uh, seven leafed sprig of laurel being held in someone's hand, and it's part of a um, an Apollo inv invocation. And um, one of the interesting things that I discovered actually before I started working on this deck, but only within the last few years, I remember um, encountering this symbol in the late 1990s in Stephen Flower's book, Hermetic Magic. And he suggested that on this moral leaf, you should kind of go back and forth in a number of different confusing ways because in the Betts book, they actually there are actually eight symbols rather than seven so it's it's hard to imagine how you would put eight symbols on seven sprigs so he suggested one method i've, I've encountered a few other people who've suggested other methods but i felt like all of them were a little bit off to me and, and I, I was wondering how to represent it and um in making my own actually i i have i have one right here that i made um this is my personal one uh and I got the strong message that I should look at the papyrus, the original, you know, the, the original place where it came from. So I found it online. And in fact, there are only seven symbols. The, the seventh and eighth symbol that are represented in the Betts book are one symbol, um, which if you, if you go to the, the, the original papyrus, you can very clearly see it. There's a line going right through to connect them. It's a, it's a large symbol. It's kind of you know, much larger than the rest of the symbol I'll show it to you on here. Um, it has sort of two parts, but there's this clear line going through it. Um, so that's the way I represented it in the, in the cards as well. Down here. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but... <laughs> um, so, you know, there are these mysteries that aren't really mysteries within a lot of this stuff. If you just go back to the papyrus very frequently, um, the translators haven't really cared to do it because they're not magical practitioners so they don't really look into things all that deeply and, and I went back to 
um, praise and dance, the original German translation, which contains the, the Greek, and he's got it um, as eight symbols as well. So that's obviously where the error originated from, and nobody bothered to look at the papyrus because they weren't planning on actually making something like this. So, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, this the, the reason that this felt um, good as an ace for me um, is is because in this this is a this is an invocation of um, Apollo, and the 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 concept of the ace of wands for me when i'm doing a reading for people when i see it i usually interpret it as um there's sort of a a, a a guiding force from the universe a new sort of direction for you to go in a mission from the universe so to speak that, it, that, is, that you're being assigned and so you know it felt very right to have a, an invocation of of, of a, a god who would guide you in, in where you should be going in your life as the the ace um there are a few other obviously invocations that could have been used, but this one happens to contain this um, laurel wand as, as a component to it. And the, and the wand does not occur all that frequently in the Greek magical papyri, although there are one or two other places where something like that is mentioned, including there's a there's a second wand involved in this particular spell, a, an ebony wand, which is another place where they where the, the translation is rather odd. They call it a, a branch of ebony, in or uh, I think in the in the translation, but the word um, the Greek word actually refers to a number of different sizes of things uh, related to you know bits of wood. It can be anything from a rod to a staff to a twig. Um, it, it's translated uh, by different people at different times. So um, having a small piece of ebony uh, certainly seems like it would suffice. I think that I think that it makes it it makes it seem like you need a huge staff of ebony, which which isn't going to you know, balance very well with, uh, you know, a, a seven sprig. Oh, so by the way, this is an actual um, sprig of um, from a from a laurel tree that I that's on my property, and um, I did a, I did the, one of the plant picking um, spells for for picking it, and um, I actually wrapped it then the actual stem with wire. And so it's it's all sort of being held together. So I mean, it would it would break if I was overly rough with it, but it basically it will last forever, uh, as uh, a twig would not normally do so because I've kind of reinforced it. I also put um, papyrus on the back of it to reinforce the leaves as well and help them sort of stay straight. Although they've they've actually bent a little bit over time um, as it is because uh, that's just the nature of you know plant parts as they are in the world. So that's the ace and my own little representation of the ace. Um, the two, we see um, the figures in it. There's sort of one full, so as I mentioned previously, there's there's sort of eight, a, a particular figure group that goes with each of the suits. And this, and this suit has a, a little philosopher as the, as the character. So there's one philosopher who's kind of bowing to another philosopher and uh, the um, the spell here is a spell for domination and getting someone under your foot. So it's really a, it's a it's a representation of kind of one of the ways in which twos can come together. The, the all of the twos kind of have some representation of that. Um, with the with the coins, we had the two women running off, and you'll see next week either the cups is uh, two women running towards each other. Or the um, the swords, where there's um, two two uh, um, soldiers kind of moving away from each other. So this this is a one one of the sort of options for twos. So because I mean two basically it's a simple concept. Either you're coming together or you're separating <laughs> one way or another. So those are basically the four variations on on that sort of connection between people that are possible. Um, the the quote from the Iliad in this case is. Uh, stood holding a scepter which Hephaestus produced by his labors. Um, so we have a, a guy standing with his with his um, with his scepter and and a dominating spell and that message. So that's that's the twos. Um, the threes um, to me generally represent sort of synthesis or or coming. You know, there's there's the cycle of 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 creation, but just as importantly as this idea that like there's a there's two opposing forces 
and a third force kind of brings those together in some way and makes an entirely new entity out of them, um, and you know, sort of archetypally with with the threes. And so we, here we have sort of two very sort of arrogant seeming uh, philosophers with one kind of standing between them going, hey, we can, we can come to common, common ground here. Right? Um, and so the, the, um, the spell is one of um, dominating, but also sort of connecting and, and you know, being, being um, still forceful, but, but a little bit less aggressive than, than the previous one. And the, uh, the quote is, in which way I will for sure accomplish everything and how it will be brought to pass. <laughs> which is a, a very sort of woolly statement, but uh, it somehow seems to fit that, that concept in there. Um, so the, the four of, 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 of wands has um, four philosophers and they're all kind of just moving along. And they've got some laurel uh, wreath that they're, that they're carrying with them. And because the four kind of, to me, represents things getting into a, some sort of order um, not necessarily a stable one, so we don't see them kind of standing there. Um, this is the, this is what I'm going to bring out the uh, the rider weight cards for. So um, in the rider weight, we have that represented as uh, the as sort of like a I don't know. It's a it could be like a wedding thing. There's definitely some sort of celebration going on in the background, and there's and there's sort of moral wreaths hanging from it. So. Um, I was I was drawing a little bit from that, but I kind of wanted to emphasize uh, one of the ways that I like to interpret this because the wands do represent sort of dynamic forces or directions. So with the four of wands, we have a, a, a flow forward in which things are relatively stable, but there's also a dynamism, which is why I wanted to have the guys moving. Um, the spell that's on it is actually a re, reinterpreted ring spell. Now, this is kind of a, a, an interesting piece of art that I've created here. Um, the ring, uh, there's been a few people on the internet who kind of tried to, to represent this, this ring, and they, and they usually put a sun circle and then just a, a, um, a moon crescent. But if we look at the actual art that was being created at that, that, that time, the gems that, that, are, that still exist, there's a bunch of them that actually depict um, Helios and Selene in just this way as, as sort of heads. Um, and so if we look at what's actually being said there is that, that Helios is supposed to be above Selene and then the, the crescent of her, of her you know, head is supposed to have two stars around it. So um, this is almost certainly what was actually being envisioned by the person who was creating that you know, that spell or, or writing it down was that, that, that it would be their heads rather than just the symbols, because although those symbols did exist at that point, they weren't very commonly used, particularly on engraved art, which is which this ring spell originally was to have. And so Abrasox is along the side and the, um, the Ouroboros is around it. And on the back of the ring, it's supposed to have the Iosabo and then also Abrasox again, but I didn't bother to put Abrasox a second time because we're dealing with a uh, you know a two-dimensional piece of art rather than a front and back situation. So um, this is sort of my reinterpretation. And if you look at the PGM, there's a there's an incredible amount of reinterpretation and reuse of, of material. So I don't feel like, although this is you know obviously not exactly the way the ring was created, I don't feel like this is completely out of touch with what someone might have done at that time if they wanted to create a two-dimensional piece of art that would represent that same idea. Um, so the the quote here is. Um, for so I shall, so shall I pro proclaim, and it will be accomplished too. So that's that's the woolly statement from from that particular card. Um, the five of wands. Now, if you look at the um, the rider weight version of this, um, we see a bunch of young um, young men sort of fighting with one another. And I basically went with a fairly similar kind of an idea um, of sort of, you know, several uh, philosophers kind of at odds with one another in one way or another. And, uh, and, you know, and the, the idea here is that there's a lot of 
different sort of directions and wills in which things could go. And when you get to five, it's not an even number, so there really can't be a you know a consensus reached. One one side is going to you know take over the other. And the number five also, you know, when we connect it with the, the, the pentacle or the pentagram, we see um, this, this um, mathematical connection between the different parts, which is something called the golden mean or, or phi. And actually, if you look at the way in which plants grow, like this one is, has sort of not, it's not quite in its natural state because, although I do think it was actually growing slightly like this, but normally plants, Will grow with basically a pentagram pattern in the way that they that they that they grow, um, and that and, and the formula of of, of phi or, or um, the golden mean actually kind of represents that spiral shape that we often see in which in which things are kind of growing at an exponential rate with one another. So there's this, there's a sense of dynamic force within um, within that archetypal principle of phi um, that that while it can be discord, it can also represent sort of dynamic power. So I don't always interpret this card as, as negative, although it certainly has a discordant possibility within it. Um, and the, the talisman of it is actually the, um, the 100 letter name of Typhon that is um, present in a, in a couple of places within the PGM and then also in a couple of places within um, gem art of, of that sign time period. And in this case, it's a phylactery when you're conjuring um, Typhon to um, you know, make sure that you're protected in some way with this name. Um, so Typhon to me represents the sort of dynamic chaotic forces that are not necessarily exactly the same as, as the, you know, the, the martial energies that we traditionally associate with the number five, um, but it seemed close enough that, and, and particularly felt appropriate within this wand um, energy. Uh, the the part from the Homer Oracle is verily these things have already happened and not otherwise could. There's a very sort of um, destiny oriented <laughs> uh, representation here, and uh, I, like I said before, not all of these were, were were chosen in a very logical manner. They were more inspired by um, things beyond myself. So. I don't know that I totally understand that one, although I feel like it fits to me in a in an intuitive way rather than in a really logical way. Um, so the the six, um, again, I, I went a little bit with the sort of basic energy that we see in the Rider Waite, um, which is which is that a sort of like a victorious procession. Although I've involved all of the little philosophers in the in the procession. And their wands are partially being used to, to hold him up, and he's got a, a victorious moral wreath. Um, and of course, the number six represents harmony and balance. Um, you know, in a, 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 a linear form, the, the hexagram or, um, has that sort of perfectly balanced energy. And, and this particular card is, it, to me, usually associated with something achieve, someone achieving success or, or moving forward in their lives in a positive way. And um, the 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 uh, talisman is one that is that is for you know achieving success and making things happen, and the quote is, "And to the victor are to go the woman and the possessions." I think this is a this is a quote from the Iliad, which is of course about um, Helen and and uh, Hector. Is that the name? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Paris, right? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't read the, the, the stories in quite a while. Um, but anyway, it's about it's about the most beautiful woman in the world causing problems, and so obviously this is this is sort of about that on some level. Um, not about the woman, but about success and victory. Um, and of course, if you're using the, that in a reading sense and you're <laughs> reading for a woman, you'll always and the woman is like, "What does this mean?" You always have to say, "Well, it's it's an archetypal statement <laughs> rather than particularly related to." your life as a human female, um, more about just sort of the concept of victory in general. Um, the, the seven of wands, um, this, this one, uh, I, I have sort of one of the philosophers standing off to the side 
um, against uh, the six other philosophers. And, and this is, of course, somewhat, again, related to the Rider Waite deck, in which uh, there's a young man who is um, confronting six other wands. They aren't seen. They are seen in these cards. Um, and, the, and the idea of the sevens, generally, is that they're, they're sort of an ambiguous um, uh, an ambiguous state of things. The seven is the one of the of the lineal shapes between one and ten that cannot be represented with just a compass and ruler because the mathematics of it are um, partial numbers. So you can't really get an even um, heptagon created without using um, other techniques in order to do it. And in fact, it's somewhat impossible to do even with those techniques, just because it's unless you're using a computer. Uh, because of the fact that the geometry is sort of in between those things. And, and the ancients noticed that. And so they, they called the seven virgin and they, and they considered seven to be the special number that was, you know, it's obviously it's the, it's a prime number as well. So, I mean, it, it has this special thing within sort of mathematical mysticism in, and the, in the tarot, generally the, the cards that are in that sort of represent a state in which things are a little unsure with the, with the, the pentacles or coins. Um, the person is waiting for their props to grow in, or in my card, obviously, a bunch of um, people are waiting for their for their coin to be to be ready to, um, to come out. Within the um, the ones, there's a there's a battle going on, and it's unclear who the victor is going to be. Although in the Rider Waite deck in particular, it seems like the the person who's on the hill has a pretty good position in order to win. And so, I mean, I, if when interpreting this card, I will certainly say, oh, oops, I'll certainly say that although um, that it's six against one, he's actually in a position where he's he's quite likely to win because of his you know moral excellence or however you want to look at that. Um, the talisman at the top is actually one of the three talismans that is not actually from the Greek magical empire themselves, but it's from a gem um, from that time period. And so the, the magical barbarous name, Abla Nathan Alba, which um, I've been told it's, it's actually Hebrew, sort of corrupted. Um, and at the bottom in Greek, it says, um, you will be victorious or you will defeat everyone. Um, and the image on the gem was, was a little Harpocrates, which is a very frequent um, occurrence on magical gems. And actually, it's, it's mentioned in um, a, a couple of spells, the, the child of Lotus is mentioned. So um, the versicle or the, or the Homer Oracle is be valiant that later generations may also speak well of you. So that's the seven. Um, for the eight, we've got um, eight philosophers. Um, this is somewhat similar to the four, but now you can see where instead of sort of, you know, stepping along at a brisk pace, they're running, clearly. <laughs> and the wands have become almost like spears and they're kind of moving forward. And there's a, there's a few um, base examples from antiquity that show a group of men running. And that's kind of what I was going for here, although I don't think that any of them have them holding wands or spears. Um, so, but this represents sort of swiftly moving along, and, and so in the in the the Crowley deck, um, it's actually called Swiftness, and shows some wands going on. I, I couldn't find my Crowley deck um, earlier, but in the Rider Waite deck, it shows it very correctly. We've got some wands moving along quite swiftly through the air. So um, we're you know we're dealing with uh, the the number eight. Um, is the number of patterns and sequences of things. Um, so what, what, what I generally see this card as is that although there's a lot of complicated things going on, um, that the eight represents a time in which those things have kind of balanced into, into enough of a harmonious relationship that things can move forward swiftly. Um, so the talisman uh, is the Hermes victory charm, um, which for those of you who are familiar with the sort of number uh, symbolism of the planets, eight is the number of Mercury. Um, so the Hermes victory charm seems appropriate um, and even contains a version of the name off right there. Um, the 
the former oracle is, up, rush into battle, the man you have always claimed to be. So it's a card for getting off your butt and moving forward. Uh, the nine, um, again, we see sort of somewhat discord, although perhaps in a balanced way. Um, there's, there's some symmetry in this one. And although there is not necessarily um, a total sense that um, everything is in, in alignment, there's a sense that everything is clear. And so the, this card generally represents to me sort of being, um, being attached to one sort of inner journey, one sort of subconscious space in which we are being guided forward in our lives, even if there are initial challenges. And so these, the, the philosophers on the side represent the initial challenge with the philosopher in the middle. Um, similarly to the three of wands, he is, he is standing there Sort of representing for himself in a strong way um, that he that he knows where he's going and that he's going to um, continue forward despite their opposition. Um, the um, the talisman at the top is another phylactery, and this is one that uh, comes at the end of a um, a lunar spell, and it's unclear whether this particular phylactery is related to that lunar spell or if it's, a, or if it's its own phylactery. Generally, people view it as being its own thing. Um, so it's a, you know, sort of a protection against all those things that would harm you along your path as you're trying to move forward. And the, um, the Homer Oracle is, and I shall send him where his heart and spirit urge him. So again, it's emphasizing that idea of your inner guidance system pushing you forward despite any opposition that you may face. Um, finally, we have the Ten of Wands. Um, and so the Ten of Wands, again, I've kind of gone with that feeling, um, you know, Crowley's version of it has a bunch of wands and they're sort of broken and they look terrible and it says ruin at the bottom, um, which is always one of those cards that when you're, when you're dealing with the public, if you, you put that card out on the, on the table, um, I only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, the, the car, <laughs> when, that, when that particular card comes up, it, it upsets a lot of people. So um, it's one of like four or five of Crowley's cards that say something really terrible at the bottom. So um, this again sort of it, it emulates a little bit the idea of the, of the type of wands that we see in the Rider Waite deck, but obviously there's all the philosophers are there and then. Um, the wands are still being placed on his back. Um, too much going on, too many different agendas, and you know that that sort of uh, thing is being emphasized there. Um, now, the the talisman is is a, a version of the phylactery from the um, the in, the oracle of Kronos, um, and it shows a, uh, a little Zeus there with holding Kronos's sickle, and then he sort of arborist name that is to be engraved on that on that uh, bone um, and the uh, the Homer oracle is the rule of the many is no good let there be one ruler so again emphasizing that idea that there's too much going on and one needs to simplify one's action so with the last few minutes that we have left go ahead and ask any questions that you have you can ask them in the, um, the, the the chat or you can ask them directly if you want to get on um, so uh, someone's asking about the, uh, my, my PGM class. Yes, I, I'm um, shooting videos tomorrow and there should be, all three of the remaining lessons should be up in um, the next 72 hours or so, hopefully. Um, so someone's saying the cards are, oh, maybe that's, that's the same person. So the cards are amazing with so many potential applications. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so if there aren't any other questions, I'll just go ahead and end it and we can talk again next week. Maybe you will have thought of a question then. Or I'll wait a couple of minutes. I'll wait until this thing says uh, I have to stop it. Um, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I enjoy rambling about my cards. <laughs> I'll just show you, I didn't pick up a few of these, so 
let me show you the, some of the early ones that I didn't show you the difference between. So obviously the ace of wands and the rider weight is pretty iconic. So, you know, you got the, uh, it's very bright. You got the, you know, the hand holding the wand. And interesting, there are some, there are some leaves. It's, it doesn't look like it's a, it's a laurel, but, it, but there are some leaves. So there's definitely like a, an archetypal connection there. The two of wands and um, weight says some weird things about some of these cards. And I think this might be one of the ones that he talks about. It's like, there's no clear definition of this card, but uh, so it shows a, a, a person sort of lording over their land, but maybe kind of wondering if there might be something more. Um, and then the three shows this uh, young man with a staff in his hand and two other staffs just kind of, kind of hanging around and there's some, you know, some sort of adventure afoot in the, in the distance that is unclear um, where that might go. But um, my interpretations of those cards tend to sort of match more with the actual um, PGM tarot images that I've created at this point and, and those and those really images represent it. So um, for me it's a it's a it's a step up in terms of more easily matching with what how I feel about the the tarot than than either the Crowley or the um, Rider Wade deck. The Crowley deck has um so a fairly like harsh looking two of of wands that's sort of fiery and, and um, clearly shows a sense of opposition going on. Um, which, you know, of course, is present in my card, although mine shows people who are sort of one is one is clearly one over the other. Um, the 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 three, I think, for me, there, there's there's so many ways in which the, 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 the concept of three different wills can go um, that I really like to have it be about sort of my sense of the person that I'm sitting with as much as about the um, situation. So this kind of has an ambiguous enough sort of meaning to it that I think they can go in a number of different ways depending on where it falls in the reading or where um, you know the person seems to be in their life. So um, the this now this this also is very vague. <laughs> you know, this could mean a lot of different things as well. So that that you know has always worked <laughs> for me, but but uh, I, I like my version better personally. Maybe some other people will too. Um, so I only have a couple of minutes left, so if I don't see any questions, oh, um, someone said they're beautiful. Um, I uh, Brent, uh, who asked the other question, has asked, um, with my few seconds left here, um, if there are any new spreads that I've created for this. In in the book, I do have a, a sort of a, a short seven card spread, which I've which I've used a number of times. Um, which is basically my five card spread, but with two more cards. And those two, those two extra cards allow you to kind of adjust some of what you've said about some of the relationships that are going on in, in the cards. Um, I, I can do a whole, I, I will do a whole class just on, on readings and I'll talk a little bit more about that reading and why I tend not to use the Celtic cross reading ever and some of the other ways that I do readings as well um, with these cards um, at some point in the future. That's one of my um, obligations, I think, to you guys who've contributed, but also I, I, I'm going to enjoy teaching that class as well. So um, I'm going to end this before it ends on us. So thank you all for being here. Um, see you next week and bring all your supporter friends. <laughs>